Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, the NCTC 3000 Project, Mapping the Genetic Codes of 3000 Pathogenic Bacteria, presented by Julie Russell, Head of Culture Collections at National Infection Services in Public Health England. I'm Dr. Cece Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appear on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Julie Russell, I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Julie. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, and I can confirm that I have no disclosures to make. So the learning objectives for this presentation are really for you to understand the value of culture collections in biomedical science. I'd like people to recognize the significance of historical strains in understanding microbial evolution and recognize some of the benefits of long read sequencing techniques for delivering reference genomes for pathogenic bacteria. And finally, I'd like you to be able to identify how the wider scientific community can contribute to the biological resources of the future. So preventing human infections from occurring is one of the key targets of the organization where I work, which is Public Health England, or PHE. The organization's mission is to protect and improve public health and respond to public health emergencies. And we also protect the nation from public health hazards, things like poisons and chemicals and radiation, bioterrorism, and we prepare for public health emergencies. So Public Health England, for example, had a significant role in preparing for the London Olympics in 2012. Now, Public Health England is the latest incarnation of an organisation that existed in varying forms within the United Kingdom since 1950. During the Second World War, there was a lot of fears about biological warfare, and that prompted the government to set up the Emergency Public Health Laboratory Service. And that provided support to doctors and medical officers in identifying bacterial strains. Britain's healthcare system pre-1948 really didn't work very well. And this changed with our National Health Service Act in 1946. And it was through this act, the Public Health Laboratory Service was formally established. And the PHLS's role was to provide microbiological investigations of communicable disease outbreaks and drinking water and food products. But of course, delivering a public health objective of preventing infection is becoming ever more pressing as the global instances of antimicrobial resistance in, in bacteria and viruses and fungi and parasites is increasing. Of course, this is a really serious problem. Anyone who goes to microbiology conferences the world over will be aware that this is always discussed, the problem of antimicrobial resistance. But in order to combat infectious disease and antimicrobial resistance, we really do need to know more about the organisms that cause disease, about the virulence mechanisms, which is how they, how they actually cause the disease and how they're transmitted, and finally, the evolution of antimicrobial resistance. So on my next slide, I've got two quotes that I selected from experts within the UK. And the first one is from Dame Sally Davis. And I selected this quote because Dame Sally has specifically highlighted that antimicrobial resistance could take us back to the 19th century, into 19th century medicine. And that's a period that I need to go back to in order to tell you the story of our NCTC 3000 project. But what I would say is in the 19th century, that was at a time of hope because our understanding of the causes, the spread and the treatment and prevention of infectious diseases was improving. But now it's kind of more a period of trepidation because actually we're not quite sure what's going to happen. We don't necessarily know that things are going to get better. 
And the second quote that I've included comes from Jeremy Farrar, who's the director of the Wellcome Trust. And he's raised something I think is also very important in the impact of antimicrobial resistance. It's often seen to be that we can't, for example, treat infections such as urine infections or pneumonia or bacterial meningitis. But actually, what it also means is that today's routine procedures, things like cesarean inspection and transplants and joint replacements and cancer treatments, these won't any longer be safe procedures. These could actually become life-threatening mm. practices. So if we go back to the 19th century and think about what was going on then. It was the dawn of health improvement. And I'm sure many know the story of, in 1854, John Snow was one of the fathers of epidemiology, and he refused to accept that cholera was, was airborne, or this miasma theory. And he famously plotted the cholera cases in London on a map, and then by doing that, he identified the source of an outbreak as a particular water pump. And he had the pump handle removed, and the cases of cholera immediately began to diminish. And this is really because people were starting to get to grips with understanding the transmission of infection, although Snow's germ theory of disease wasn't widely accepted until the 1860s, and it wasn't actually until the 1880s that Robert Cox successfully isolated the cholera of Vibrio. But this was the age of some really great scientists. In addition to Robert Cox, who I've just mentioned in Germany, there was also Louis Pasteur in France and in the US. We had Selman Waxman and, and David Henry Berge, famous for Berge's manual. And the UK was a little bit behind some of those countries when it came to microbiology. But in 1888, apparently as a result of a meeting between, between Koch and Pasteur and Joseph Lister, a new institute was set up in London. And this was the Lister Institute of Preventative Medicine. And this institute was established in Chelsea, in central London, with the donations from the Guinness family. And it had two primary aims, fundamental scientific research into the causes, prevention and treatment of disease in man and animals, and secondly, to prepare and supply protective and curative materials. Now, of course, there were no antibiotics at the turn of the 20th century, but the Institute did develop vaccines and antitoxins, and it was ranked internationally up there with the Pasteur Institute and, and of course, the Rockefeller Institute in New York. There's also a very forward-thinking microbiologist at the Lister Institute, and that was Dr. John Leddingham. And he recognized the need for a trustworthy source of globally available authentic bacteria for scientific studies. And this is a need that's still very pressing today. And with that thought, he went on to establish the National Collection of Type Cultures in 1920. So the National Collection of Type Cultures, or NCTC, was the very first collection in the world established with the specific intention of providing authentic microbial cultures for microbiologists in other laboratories to use as research. So there were other culture collections established, but not with this particular aim to provide cultures for others. And although they named it the National Collection, NCTC always had a global reach. And although the name indicates a collection of type cultures, which are also called type strains, and those are the strains on which the description of a species is based, all the strains in NCTC aren't actually type cultures. And just as a side note, all bacterial species have a type strain, but it's not necessarily the most typical example of the species. And in fact, some type strains can actually be really quite atypical. So initially, NCTC included bacteria, fungi, viruses, plasmids, all of which were considered to be of scientific importance. However, after NCT was established, other national collections followed in other countries, and they also collaborated and shared their strains, such as ATCC in the US. But in 1947, the NCTC curator, which was Samuel Cowan, decided that he was going to do something different because he decided that NCTC would only include bacteria, and it would be only those bacteria that were of significance either clinically or veterinarily. He wanted to focus on quality over quantity. So all the strains that fell outside his remit were sent to different institutes within the UK. And they went on to form the nucleus of several other specialist national collections, such as the National Collection of Plant Pathogens, the National Collection of Industrial and Marine Bacteria in Aberdeen in Scotland, and the National Collection of Pathogenic Fungi, which continues to sit within Public Health England. So Sam Cowan really wanted to ensure the authenticity of every culture remaining in NCTC, and anything that didn't meet his high standards was discarded. 
He was absolutely determined to show that it was possible to distribute cultures that were authentic, that were pure, that were typical. And the fact that this is now broadly accepted as normal practice for any culture collection anywhere in the world, and I've, I've noticed I've visited many of these collections, I think this is a measure of his success. So only freeze-dried cultures from quality control check batches were issued to third parties. And his freeze-drying policy, which he introduced later on, was really very similar to the the same procedure that's used today. So Sam Cowan and indeed the whole of NCTC transferred from the Lister Institute to the Public Health Laboratory Service in 1950 and specifically it transferred to the Central Public Health Laboratory which is based in Collinville in North London and actually NCTC is still housed in Collinville in the same area, it's not actually the same building, the building that we have now was actually opened in 1985. However, it was important that a lot of the strains that were included in NCTC came from some really, really well-regarded um, depositors, scientists of the time. So we include people like Robert Koch, Alexander Fleming, Florian Chain, Waxman, who was responsible for the development of streptomycin, and indeed other scientists such as um, Marshall and Warren, who in the 1980s were the people who were responsible for identifying that um, Helicobacter pylori was in fact the causative agent of peptic ulcers. And on that previous slide, there was something there from Alexander Fleming. That was a letter that was sent by Alexander Fleming about the Oxford staff. The Oxford staff is an organism that was selected by the Oxford Group, which were a group of scientists working at Oxford University. And this was a strain that they used because they wanted to test penicillin. And they recognised the value of being able to test penicillin the world over using the same strain. And that was why they deposited this strain, which was NCTC, as I say, 6571. And it's become known as the Oxford staff. And it's actually one of the most commonly used organisms from NCTC even today. So one of the reasons that the NCTC was moved was because it was very close to the reference laboratories. And the reference laboratories were where people, where laboratories such as NHS laboratories send strains that they need identifying. And this is an example of a more recent situation where there have been concerns since 2011 about the emergence of plasmid-mediated colistin resistance in animals and in humans. And this was first noted in China. Now, there's a lot of concern around the world, and in the UK, we have an antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infection laboratory. And that has a set of its own strains, and it decided to have a look using whole genome sequencing to see whether any of the strains that it already collected would carry this plasmid, this MCR1 mechanism for colistin resistance. When they'd looked through the strains, they actually identified one strain of E. coli that did carry the MCR1 gene. This has been isolated from a UK hospitalised patient in 2013. So what they did was they deposited this strain with NCTC very quickly. It was NCTC 13846. And this E. coli was also, um, in addition to being added to NCTC, was listed as a control strain for the European um, UCAS, which is antimicrobial susceptibility. And it's now used as a control strain regularly in hospitals and anyone who's testing antimicrobial susceptibility. Now, communicable diseases still have the potential to devastate populations. And NCTC stores outbreak strains that um, some come back to the turn of the, of, the 19th, of the 18th century. So we go back to the Boer War. And we have here some strains of typhoid due to an outbreak of typhoid fever in South Africa in 1900. So one of the first strains to be included in the collection is actually NCTC 160. That means it was the 160th strain to be included in the collection. We can go back to the very first strain of all in the collection, which has NCTC 1 as its catalogue number. And that was isolated from a British soldier who died of dysentery during World War I. And then we've also got a strain 2028, and that's from the type of outbreak that always spreads fear and fascination. It's an outbreak of plague that happened in 1920s in what's now known as Indonesia. If we move on to more recent outbreaks, NCTC has an authentic strain of Legionella pneumophila, and that's a strain that caused a lethal outbreak of a pneumonia type of illness in US Legionnaire's disease attending a conference in Philadelphia in 1976, and that's known as NCTC 11192. 
And only a few years ago, in 2011, NCTC obtained a strain that caused the second largest outbreak on record of foodborne illness attributed to a Shiga toxin producing E. coli, which is serotype 104. Now, this affected mostly people in Germany, um, but it also caused death and serious illness in people further afield as well. And this was associated with contaminated bean sprouts. So I've talked a bit about NCTC and the cultures that we have there, the bacteria that are of a clinical and veterinary importance. I'd just like to note that that is only one of four collections operated by Public Health England. And the other three all were established, of course, after 1920, after NCTC. And those include the National Collection of Pathogenic Fungi that was set up in 1947 after Sam Cowan had decided to change the focus of NCTC. And then we roll forward to the 1980s and we have the European Collection of Authenticated Cell Cultures that that started up and really preserves and distributes cell cultures of human and animal origin. And finally, we have the smallest and the newest of the collections, although it's still nearly 20 years old, and that's the National Collection of Pathogenic Viruses, and that was established in 1999. Now, all four of these collections evolved under different management, different management philosophies. So it was challenging for some staff when in 2003, all these collections were brought together under the same management structure. And those are the collections that I'm actually responsible for now. And personally, I think it made a lot of sense to bring them all together because actually all the collections have the same remit in the end. And that's to provide authentic cultures to the global biomedical community in order to improve the quality of research and diagnostic testing. So why do we need authentic cultures? Well, when scientists devise research projects or develop diagnostic tests. They always think really hard about the procedures. They want to validate the equipment. They're going to think about which reagents they want and which kits that fit the purpose. And for data analysis, they'll be thinking about whether they have the right software, are they doing the right statistical tests. But when it comes to biological resources, sometimes they seem to think it's okay after all that work to use an old cultures in the back of someone's freezer and that can do the job. And I suppose sometimes it might do, but Sometimes it won't, and there's a really grave risk associated with that. So if you think about it, if you're using a microorganism that's susceptible to a particular antibiotic, and you know this is what your control strain is, you'll get more likely to get the right result than if you're using something that you're not sure about the authenticity. And if you get an incorrect result when you're testing an antimicrobial susceptibility in a clinical lab, you could actually give the wrong treatment to a patient. It could actually have an impact on someone's life. So really having the authentic control is a far better idea. And if you're researching breast cancer, it's good to know that you're using breast cancer cells and not accidentally using um, cervical cancer cells, for example, HeLa cells, which are very commonly misidentified cell lines. Because we all know that a lack of reproducibility in scientific research is a major concern, and some of this irreproducibility has been attributed to misidentified cultures. So perhaps it might be useful to just give a little bit of information about how a culture collection operates. Well, all the culture collections operate in a similar manner, not only the four within PHE, but pretty much all the others as well. And what happens is the collection receives the strains and the data from the depositor, so the person who's spending in the culture. And the data really is very important as well. And then once we've received the, the strains, we'll culture them, make sure that they're viable, that they're alive, that they're pure, i.e. they're not contaminated, and we check the identity. And then we use the appropriate preservation method to prepare in parallel a master bank, which will be kept indefinitely. And also the first batch will stop and supply. And when the first stock grows low, we go back to the master bank to make the next one. So what we're doing here is avoiding a serial subculture. And the master bank in every subsequent batch is quality control tested to make sure that it survives the preservation process, which is said is freeze drying or lyophilization for NCTC cultures. And then we need to test the authenticity. And those tests can be morphological, so we make sure that the organism kind of looks right. We're also going to make sure the phenotypic tests, the biochemistry tests are okay, and we'll do some genomic testing as well. And if the depositor has identified a particular specialist test that we may not be familiar with within our own organization, we would send examples from the batch back to the depositor to ask them to also confirm that what we have in the collection, what we've preserved is exactly what they sent to us in the first place. So we, again, there's authenticity test undertaken by the depositor. 
So in NCTC, once this first batch has all been prepared and it's passed its quality control test, what we then need to do is enter all the data into um, our data management system. And that will include not only the location of the strain, but also the stock control, but all the biosecurity information, safety information, the limitations of supply. So sometimes depositors might want to be told every time we provide a strain that they've deposited, and we can accommodate that if that's what they need. And by doing that, we need to put that into the into the stock control system. So all the, everything related to that particular strain is all in the same place. And it may be that depositors are concerned about commercial use, and if they want to know about that, we can also put instruction for that as well. But once all that's been completed and the strain's been added, we then have to put it on the online catalog, and that means this is then made available to third parties. And to give an indication of that, we probably accession around 300 new NCTC bacterial strains every year, and then we distribute around 10,000 NCTC samples to third parties. Now, I mentioned that the data is really important, the metadata associated with the cultures, because that really adds value. So we want to know when we receive the cultures, ideally the dates and the source and the site of infection. We don't always have all that information, but of course we can add to it. In the same way that the collection itself is dynamic and we receive new cultures all the time and occasionally cultures die and we have to remove them, with the data we can add data um, which makes them more valuable. And that might be that we add data because we've retrieved additional information by mining archive documentation or we've reviewed publications but it may be that we've generated new data for some of the historical strains and that's really what i'm going to focus on next is the generation of new data i'm going to start with talking about the murray collection so in addition to the thousands of strains that we have listed in the online nctc catalog we also hold other donated collections and these are stored safely, but not made publicly available because of lack of resources. So NCTC doesn't actually receive any public funding. So we have to generate the income from the sales of the strains to deliver all the operational costs. So resources are a bit limited. And one of these collections that we've stored safely, but not been able to make available, this Murray collection, consists of several hundred strains, predominantly Enterobacteriaceae. And these were amassed by Professor Everett George Dunn Murray in Canada. And he collected these during the pre antibiotic era. So that was between 1917 and the early 1950s. And his son, who was also a microbiologist, Robert Murray, inherited these strains and arranged to have the Murray collection transferred to Canada from Canada to NCTC in the 1980s. And with the help of an NCTC scientist, Rita Legro, who's pictured there, who was actually a Canadian national, the strains were brought to the UK. A small number of amples of freeze dried cultures of each strain were prepared and they were put into storage. But they weren't neglected, although they were, they were put away safely. We had two scientists in NCTC in the 80s, Naomi Data and Vic Hughes. And they studied these strains, demonstrating the common occurrence of plasmid groups known to carry antimicrobial resistance. What they really wanted to do was determine whether pre-antibiotic era plasmids belonged in the same group as the modern resistant plasmids. And by modern, I'm talking about in the 1980s. And it appeared that medically important bacteria had acquired resistance over the past 25 years from the insertion of new genes into existing plasmids rather than by the spread of previously rare plasmids. So this data was really valuable. And this was all new data that's already enhancing the value of the Murray collection. However, in 2011, as these things often are, the result of a chance conversation in a pub between NCTC scientist and Dr. Nick Thompson from the Wellcome Sanger Institute, that led to a discussion about the Murray Collection. And the Murray Collection is a collaborative piece, but um, from that discussion in the pub became a collaborative project to sequence the genomes of the bacteria in the Murray Collection. And that work was undertaken by Kate Baker at the Sanger Institute and Hannah McGregor in NCTC. And the subsequent publications were really very interesting with the whole genome sequences for these additional 500 strains. And also as a result of this, we did make the Murray Collection available. And there's a link at the bottom of that slide that really takes you to the, to the um, publications associated with that piece of work. And another example was related to NCTC1, which I've mentioned before, the very first strain in the collection. So the first group of bacterial strains to be deposited with NCTC was Shigella species. 
And Shigellas associated with dysentery, and these ones were isolated from soldiers who died of dysentery or suffered from dysentery in France during the First World War. Now, these were British soldiers, but in fact, dysentery was very common across all the troops, I think, in the First World War. But we do know a little bit more about the first strain than we used to do. And this is due to a really fantastic piece of work that was done by Dr. Alison Maver, together working with Kate Baker and Nick Thompson, all of the people working at the, at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute at this time. And this strain was listed in our, in our archives as a cable strain. And, Al, and Alison Maver, who had particular interest in military history, wondered if cable could actually be the soldier's name, bearing in mind that the depositor was known to have worked in military hospitals in World War I. And after a huge amount of research, what made her determined was the strain was actually isolated from Private Ernest Cable. And he died of his infection in 1915. And she actually found his memorial stone, which can be found in the Wimmera Cemetery in France, very close to the site of where the military hospital is where he died. So this provided additional data about the strain, and that's very interesting. But it's not necessarily of huge scientific significance. However, Baker and Thompson sequenced the genome in 2021 this Shigella flexneri, and they compared it to the whole genome sequence of some more recent isolates of Shigella flexneri. A couple of things that were really useful and interesting when they did this. First of all, they determined a plasmid that was likely to have carried some virulent genes in NCTC1 was probably missing. And they reckon this could possibly be due to serial passaging of the strain. Now, this is necessary because, as I said, we try very much in NCTC to avoid serial subculture. But freeze drying to preserve the bacteria was only introduced by Samuel Cowan in the 1940s. So strains that were brought into NCTC in 1920 needed to be subcultured to keep them alive. And it's possible that during this period, we lost one of the plasmids from NCTC1. But nevertheless, they were absolutely delighted that they generated a high quality sequence of the bacterium's chromosome. And having a 100 year old genome to compare modern strains against really provides some clues about the recent evolution of Shigella. One of the things they noticed is that NCTC1 is resistant to penicillin. And that's perhaps not that surprising because if you think about it, um, these strains are probably exposed to soil and you get a lot of fungi in the soil, so they could easily have been exposed to naturally arising penicillins. But however, the group also found that modern Shigella flexner strains have evolved greater resistance to quite a number of other antibiotics that the cable strain was perfectly capable of fending off. And again, there's a couple of publications there in the Lancet, which can be found through the link on the bottom of the slide there. So we move on to the NCTC 3000 project because this followed on directly from the work of the Murray Collection and also incorporated the NCTC1 work. And we were delighted to be contacted by Professor Julian Parkhill, who heads the pathogen genomics team at the Sanger Institute. And he contacted us because he wanted to propose something far more ambitious than the one's work we've done already. He wanted to generate whole genome sequences for 3,000 NCTC bacteria. And I can't really remember why we chose 3,000. It represented about half of the publicly available collection. And the only thing we did agree on was that it would include all the type strains, that all of those would be sequenced if we were able to take this project forward. So we applied for and we were actually granted funding from the Wellcome Trust, which covered not all, but some of the costs of the project. And our initial intention was actually to use short read technology to deliver the genomes. And an important aspect of this project from the point of view of the Wellcome Trust was that we'd make this genomic data widely and freely available as soon as possible. So the project would require NCTC to select the bacterial strain, to extract the DNA, make sure it was inactivated, and that required quite a few validation studies because we needed to make sure that whatever we were going to send to the Sanger was absolutely safe. And then when we'd done all that, we were going to transfer the DNA extract to the Sanger Institute. And then Julian's team would be responsible for the actual sequencing, for the annotation, for uploading data onto the public databases. And then finally, in parallel, NCTC would be developed what we call the e-resource. This is essentially an enhanced searchable website that would ensure that all the metadata is easily available, easily accessible to third parties. So shortly after we'd started this project, there was a, a really very exciting development when Julian Parkhill contacted us to tell us that PacBio wanted to support the project. And I'm not a molecular scientist, but I could tell Julian was really excited about this. And I very soon understood exactly why, because 
What this meant was we could generate better quality, closed, complete genomes. And this meant this long read technology could be applied to the very wide range of organisms in the collection. So some of the other ways of sequencing would have some sort of limitations, such as related to G plus C ratios of the organisms, perhaps. But regardless of what organisms we were going to sequence, this was a technique that would probably work really well and give us closed genomes. And so, for example, we have strains with a lot of repeat sequences, such as clinical important species like Bordetella pertussis. But we felt these would probably be able to be sequenced successfully. There was one challenge in adopting this long read technology, and that was that we really needed to ensure the quality of the DNA extracted from the strains was suitable. So we needed to avoid overshearing the DNA because this process would require high quality, high molecular weight genomic DNA. And although it was a bit of a challenge, it was certainly surmountable because there were a lot of advantages, as I've already mentioned. And some of the advantages of using this packed biosequencing was that not only would the process deliver many more closed genomes, it had mapped repetitive genomes, but it could also access methylation patterns. And this is important because we know that not all the bacterial genes are active all the time, they're not all being expressed. And DNA methylation is one of several methods that's thought to be involved in the expression of genes associated with virulence. And of course, because our collection is about pathogenic organisms, virulence is, is very significant. So this process is also sensitive, it has a relatively short runtime, and I use these jigsaw images to really demonstrate. It's really simple to look at the, those and see that on the left-hand side, you've got a jigsaw with hundreds or thousands of pieces, which is essentially short read sequencing, and it will take quite a long time, a lot of accuracy to get the complete picture. Whereas on the other side, you've got those small four or five piece jigsaws, which is basically what, what long read sequencing is. And it makes it a lot easier to put those few pieces together and get a very accurate picture. So now we've got some NCTC 3000 statistics. And I think they really speak for themselves. The first thing that was really exciting is the team actually over delivered because rather than 3,000 strains, we extracted DNA from 3,230. The reason we did that is because it's a high throughput project, so we couldn't just stop if something went wrong. We needed to keep delivering the DNA, and we needed to, have, we needed to allow for anything going wrong. So if there was any mix-ups and we had to discard a batch, even though we had a lot of QC in place, we were aware that with something that's such a high throughput, there was scope for human error. And we also needed to if we suspected um, something had been oversheared or if, if the, our colleagues at, at the Sanger told us that we'd oversheared, then we could just press on and move on to the next, next batches of DNA. So that was all pretty exciting. But these stats as well, the fact that we actually managed to sequence 852 species, we represented 82 families. And the sequencing that began in November 2013 was finally completed in June 2018. And excitingly, more than half of the, of the organisms that we sequenced, we managed to assemble the genome in a single contig. So that's like one piece. 92% were assembled in less than five contigs, and nearly a quarter of them had evidence of plasmids. Now, that was important because we knew we talked about losing plasmids before. And we also had a concern that perhaps long read sequencing, would we wouldn't detect some of the plasmids. Now, it's possible that we haven't detected some of the very small plasmids, and we're going to go back and look at that later. But there's evidence that we're clearly picking up plasmids through these sequences. And that's another way of looking at the data. Now, it might appear here that um, these are the strains that we sequence, the enterobacteriaceae are kind of disproportionately represented. But actually, that is really um, a focus on the collection itself. The collection um, is really focused on health outbreaks. Lots of these are caused by Salmonella, by Shigella, by E. coli. Hospital-acquired infections include organisms such as Enterobacter and Klebsiella. And, and these are the sorts of organisms that is within the remit of PHE. So it's not very surprising, these statistics. But in total, 852 species and 82 families, I think, is a pretty broad spectrum. And you can see, looking at these pathogens as well, then we have clearly contributed to, um, a lot of genomes to some pathogens of concern. You've got Neisseria gonorrhea there. We've got Haemophilus influenzae, Shigella dysenteriae, a whole range of pathogens. 
So when we completed this, and we're in a position to announce that we completed this project, there was lots of the assembled genomes needed to be uploaded and the final stage of releasing won't happen until next year with regards to the e-resource. But the main part of the project had been delivered and there was really quite a significant global press interest in the project. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the headlines really focused on the dangerous and the deadly. The bacteria that were preserved in the collection that caused diseases like plague and dysentery and cholera. And there was also a lot of talk about decoding superbugs and there was a lot of focus on tuberculosis and supergonorrhea, which obviously captures the imagination in the press. Although, to be fair, I suppose we think about it, mycobacterium tuberculosis and Neisseria gonorrhea between them infect nearly 90 million people a year with 1.7 million deaths attributed to tuberculosis in 2016. And recent WHO reports state that gonorrhea is becoming almost untreatable. So perhaps that does explain why there was so much attention. But I think some of the headlines, really important headlines, were also about what we contributed scientifically. Now, obviously, the dangerous and the deadly are important, but my colleague, Dr. Sarah Alexander, trawled the databases in May 2018 and found that some of these really quite astonishing data. So 12% of the type strains that we'd sequenced not only have no whole genome sequence data available for the type strain, but actually there was no data available for the entire species. 30% of the type strains had no previous whole genome sequence data at all. And for 44%, only draft genome data was available. So this really was filling a very important gap in the public databases for important pathogenic sequences. So clearly, the data is really important. We can resolve recombinant and repeat regions. We are able to look for virulence determinants from the genome sequences for drug and vaccine development. We can determine assay target sites. And the phylogeny and population genetics can also be, can be undertaken using this data. So what I'm going to do now is just give a couple of examples of where the data from the NCTC 3000 project is already being used. And the first example is from Cat Holt's group in Melbourne, Australia. And that used a genome sequence from 81 strains of Klebsiella species. So Klebsiella pneumoniae is associated with antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infection. And there are multiple mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance within this species. And the species consists of capsular organisms, and these can be distinguished phenotypically according to the capsule type. But the genetic diversity associated with capsular type is largely unknown. So the group looked at genomes from 2,600 strains of Klebsiella, including those 81 from the NCTC 3000 project. And from that data, they managed to identify 134 distinct capsular loci or K loci. And not only that, they also presented a new tool for the identification of the K loci from genome sequences. It's not only used for Klebsiella pneumoniae, but it can also be used for other species where capsular epidemiology is thought to be important. And then the second study, this one looks at um, Clostridium perfringens. And Clostridium perfringens is an organism that causes human and animal infections. And in this case, the author sought to understand and characterize the genomic variation and the, pan and the pan genomic diversity. And they used five strains from NCTC 3000 um, to add to a further 51 strains of their own Clostridium perfringian strains. And they really wanted to understand the virulence factors associated with C. perfringians and the genetic relatedness of this strain. And what they found was the pan genome was really quite diverse. There was frequent gene exchange in evolutionary history associated with profages, with toxins and antimicrobial resistance genes, and that potentially influenced pathogenicity. So this is a quite different example of where the NCTC 3000 data was being used. But we have a lot of future challenges, despite the fact that it's being used. And one of those is really to get people to understand that within the scientific community that authentic biological resources are essential. We need to persuade colleagues that they should take time to deposit strains and that will benefit science. We know there's a lot of myths out there. People keep asking us how much it costs to deposit strains with NCTC, but in fact it's free to deposit and actually our staff are there and they can help. 
either with transport, with compliance, with biosecurity regulations. So it doesn't cost anything at all. We can even send packaging if that's what people need. And it's clear that sometimes people are concerned about why should we give the strains to you and you're going to make a lot of money commercially, which sadly isn't the case at all. But we actually only provide strains for research and diagnostic purposes. And any commercial requests are dealt with separately. And we can discuss that with the depositor if that's what's required. I think it's also important to consider that actually, really, with whole genome sequencing-based technologies, we may end up with less cultivation of microorganisms. And if we have less cultivation of microorganisms, we won't be able to add to these collections in the future. Because culture collections like NCTC can't easily be updated retrospectively. They need to be updated in real time because they represent a living history of human infectious diseases. Now, of course, even when people say they are using authentic strains, that's not always the case. And I've just got a couple of examples here where we can see that scientists have been sharing the strains, probably with the best will in the world. But we'd really like to say be very careful about, about sharing strains. They may not be what you think they are. And I'm afraid I have named and shamed a couple of people here. So please don't be those scientists that send out strains to third parties without authenticating them. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you of the key role that culture collections play, such as NCTC, in biomedical research and in diagnostic testing. Historically, strains help us with our, sorry, historical strains help our understanding of microbial evolution. And today's circulating strains, if you remember, are tomorrow's historical strains. So it is really important. I think it's important to note that if you need reference genomes, long gene, long read methods are more informative. And the, back, the pack bio technology that we used in our NCTC 3000 project was, was fantastic, and we were really very grateful for their support. And finally, whole genome sequencing can direct the development of new drugs and vaccines to combat human pathogens. So our NCTC team is very, very committed to continuing the legacy that we inherited from very great bacteriologists in the 19th century. So with that, I'd like to end there. I'd like to thank the NCTC current team that's pictured, and also the depositors, and everyone who's maintained NCTC over the past 98 years, including all of those people that kept the records that made this collection really valuable for scientists in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and will address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. Our speakers will follow up with your questions via email. <clears throat> so let's get started. Our first question today, Julie, is how long will the NCTC cultures survive after freeze drying? Okay, so that really depends on the species. Some species we know will survive for 50 years or more without changing at all. Other species, I mentioned Helicobacter pylori in my presentation, will last for less than that time. They might only last for five years. But we have a process in place for checking the viability. We have a lot of historical data, so we know when to make new batches, so we avoid the batches dying and we lose the cultures. And Julie, do you think the WGS results really represent the whole genome for all the bacteria you've sequenced? I think it represents most of it. As I mentioned, we possibly could lose, lose some of the very small plasmids using long read sequencing, but we can go back and use a different technique to capture those. But in general, yes, I think in most cases we've captured the whole genome. Thank you, Julian. What's the next project for NCTC? Okay, well, I've talked about some of the collections that we, that we store, but we haven't made available. And we have a collection of bacteriophages and we also have a collection of, of plasmids. And we're working with those at the moment, and we're going to really make those available. We want to do some sequencing. The phage collection is particularly interesting because, of course, with the concerns about antimicrobial resistance, we're looking at different means of 
of treating infection. Bacteriophages were used quite commonly until probably the 1950s when people started using antibiotics. However, in the Soviet Union and, and Eastern Europe, they continued to use bacteriophages because bacteriophages are viruses that, that kill bacteria. And they can very specifically target individual types of bacteria. So they can be used clinically and there's a huge amount of interest in phage therapy at the moment. That's why we're going to be looking at that. But also plasmids um, can be important in, in gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer. So these two collections are really our next projects and that's what we started working on right now. Julie, would you like to provide any closing remarks? No, I think I've probably covered most of it. I really did want to emphasize the importance of, of really using authentic cultures um, in scientific research, in diagnostic testing, because without that, it really could be just bad science. Julie, thank you again for your presentation and your important research. I'd also like to thank Luab Roots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2018. You'll receive an email from Lab Roots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.